Well, by the blinking red light, I see the, uh, the broadcast has begun. You caught me in mid-sip of my coffee. I'm still drinking out of the Cleveland Browns cup, despite the debacle last Sunday. You know, I don't jump off the bandwagon that fast. But if they lose to the Bengals this Sunday, I can't guarantee anything. But uh, you're not tuning in to, to hear about anything like that. We'll talk about something more important. Glad you're, you're here. And uh, we're going to continue in our study in James. Again, tonight we're in James chapter 1. And uh, we'll be reading a couple minutes, verses 16 through 18 of that chapter of that book, sort of searching for wisdom in uh, the book of James. Uh, there was a father who had five children, and he had won a contest, won a toy in a contest, and so uh, he was going to pass it on to one of the kids, and, and he called all five kids together to ask which of them should get the present. And uh, so he asked some questions. He asked, who is the most obedient? Who never talks back to mother? Who does everything she says? And almost in unison, five voices answered, okay, dad, you get the toy. Uh, we, we, it's easier to joke about dad than mom, I guess, and maybe for good reason. I'm going to talk a little bit about father uh, tonight, and uh, not so much uh, human fathers, but the father, the father of us all, uh, this father that we all have in common. And there is this little section in James 1, beginning at verse 16, that speaks of him and says some things. I just want us to maybe meditate on sort of a, a devotional meditation a bit tonight. Um, so, recalling these words together from James chapter 1. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I just want us to dwell on those words for a few minutes and, and uh, work our way through that a bit. Uh, there's really so much packed in those three verses, and I want to dig a little bit of it out together as we look at it. Uh, there was a book entitled, When You've Been Wronged, uh, the author's name was Erwin Lutzer, and he tells the following story in the book. He says there was a young preacher who had begun an outreach on Saturday mornings to the inmates of the local county jail. Each week he'd go into the jail cells and conduct Bible studies and pray with the inmates, mostly young white men who were doing time for anything from burglary to uh, drug crimes. As he'd entered the jail, the despair and anger among these 19 to 24 year olds was palpable. When the young preacher asked the warden how so many young men with great promise could end up in such a place, the warden just sighed and said, this place is filled with boys who got tired of waiting for their dads to keep their promises, promises to provide, promises to show up and spend time with them, promises to come home at night. They finally got so angry with the injustice of it, they went out and did stupid things. I think about that, uh, what he said there, young men waiting for their dads to keep their promises. And it could apply whether it's young men or young women, you know, what a sobering reminder that broken promises can help send a young person down a road of personal destruction. 
And we know that happens all too often in, in our society. Uh, if you were blessed with a good dad, you, you had a great blessing. I feel like I was blessed with a, a great dad. I know not everybody experienced that. I remember one of the very first church Bible classes that I taught when I began uh, working with a local church. It was actually a college class. There were probably, oh, I don't know, 40 or 50 college students in it. And I was all primed and, and you know, ready to, to share a study with them. And uh, the, the top part of the topic that night was the God who loves us, the, the loving Father. And, and the need to love uh, the loving father. And I can remember there was a girl that raised her hand, oh, maybe, maybe 10 minutes into class, and just I could tell she was uh, hurting and uh, was really concerned about what was being said. She, and she said something that I had never considered very much up to that point, and that is, what if you didn't have a father that you could love or that you that, that deserved honor and respect? And how, how do you uh, love and respect the Heavenly Father when your earthly father was so awful? That was and that was not a question I was prepared to answer at the time. It's still a tough one, you know. Um, that's something we need to keep in mind as we as we work with people. Not everybody's had the same experience with good home, or good parents, and that kind of thing, and that can affect the way they respond to to the message that we uh, sometimes bring. But we know that that happens way too much in our society, and so uh, all the more reason to to celebrate and uphold good fathers and put them forward as examples to be imitated. This passage really talks about a good father um, here in James chapter 1 and the fact that, that the Heavenly Father is not like that one who uh, breaks promises and, and so forth. He, uh, he keeps promises. He does not say one thing and do another. He doesn't bring bad things only good things. And so James begins by saying, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Why would they be deceived? Because they were tempted to believe that God sends bad things their way. If you're dealing with people in a pagan world, which frankly our world is becoming more and more like that, all right? The pagan world didn't have good images of God to work with. They, the gods to them were working against them. If you got on their bad side, awful things would happen to you, that kind of thing. That was what they uh, expected. They were tempted to believe that God, the gods, brought bad things their way, especially if you offended them. And so here James is dealing with people that we know were going through trials. They were being tempted. They were suffering. But he's trying to remind them those things don't come from God. They're not authored by the Heavenly Father. He only brings good things. So let's recall a little bit what we saw in the last couple of, uh, of studies from James. That is particularly that there is this cycle of spiritual life um, that James discusses a little bit earlier in chapter 1 where, where we face hard times. And then through faith, we build endurance as we work our way through those difficult times. And then as a result, we grow. And so it's sort of like hard times, building endurance, and then growth. And it's just the cycle of spiritual life that God has designed. Uh, but James reminds us here, don't fall into the trap of thinking that God is the one who uh, brings the hard times, that, that he's the one tempting us to evil or, or sending the suffering upon us. He emphasizes here that God only 
authors good things. Good things come from God. So, you know, if you if you uh, accept what the Bible says about, especially in the beginning, God created a good world. He created a perfect world. Read Genesis chapter 1. You have uh, the of creative work when when those days end God looks at all that he has made and he says it is very good each day he said it's good at the end he sums it up by saying it was very good it's perfect he created perfect place for Adam and Eve to live um, now it didn't stay that way and uh, as you read on into chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis, sin enters, mankind falls in sin, and the world then becomes a place where bad things can happen at times. A place where suffering is an actual reality. A place where Satan enters the scene and he tempts and he attacks and he tries to destroy. But God remains God. God is still good. And any good in this world is to be credited to God. So if you look uh, again at verse 17 of the text, he says it this way, every good and perfect gift is from above. And so as people of faith, we either believe that or we sort of throw out the whole book. You know, um, if it's not true, that God is good, and that he's good all the time, then what else can we believe that is that is claimed in Scripture? Every good and perfect gift is from him. Now that doesn't mean that he, he won't work through trials and temptations that we receive from other sources, uh, but good is, is, is authored by the good father. And so that point is, is underlined even more strongly in the next phrase in the verse where it says, you know, it begins, every good and perfect gift is from above. And then it goes on and says, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And so here we have one of the names of God in Scripture, uh, the Father of lights. What's that title mean, the Father of lights? Again, I think it sort of harkens us back to the creation story. Um, Genesis chapter 1, remember uh, that in Genesis 1, at the very opening of creation, God speaks light into existence. Let there be light, God says. And then later, first he speaks light into existence, and then he creates those things that we uh, afterward associate with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, but first God said, let there be light. You know, he is the source of light. He is the father of light. But then, sad thing happened in the history of mankind. If you think about it, there came a time, and probably not, not too long after, uh, we read the, the creation account, uh, there came a time when man got this all confused and actually began to worship the, the, uh, the things that God created. So worshiped the sun. We know the Egyptians, for instance, uh, probably their main god that they worshiped was the sun god. Uh, but almost every culture worshiped the sun in some way. Uh, and, and then the moon, most cultures had a moon god, and then the stars, and, and, and just man began to, to worship the creation rather than the creator, and made the creation out to be God. Um, but Genesis 1 and James 1 are both very clear that while God created light, let there be light, he is not the sun, the moon, and the stars. He is separate and distinct from those. He is above all those. 
in fact, the, the, the point that James make, makes here shows this. If you look again at verse 17 very closely, from an earthly perspective, the sun, moon, and stars do not shine all the time, do they? I mean, from our perspective, as we look at the heavens, uh, the sun doesn't shine 100% of the time. Thank you that it doesn't. Um, that would be life in a desert, right? Um, and the same with the moon and the stars. From our perspective, they don't shine all the time. And so that's why we have day and night. That's why we have different seasons. And that's why we have shadows and so forth. But with God, it is 100% high noon all the time. As far as his goodness is concerned, uh, there is no shadow with him. There's no variation or change in his goodness toward us. I think that's the way to understand uh, the phrase that James writes, writes there. In, in our verse in James 1. Sometimes what happens is, uh, you know, people blame God for bad things, uh, which is a temptation for us all. You know, why didn't you stop this, God? Why didn't you prevent this? People tend to blame God for bad things, which is really a mistake. And then when good things happen, the temptation is to sort of take credit for it themselves, you see, which is also a mistake. It's the opposite in both cases. Um, with God, according to James, it's all good all the time. And anything bad that comes, comes from somewhere else. So I can't personally take credit for the good, and I can't blame God for the bad. With our God, there are no broken promises. What he says, he does, 100% of the time. We can count on it, just like a good earthly father would be. You ought to be able to count on what he says, uh, what, that he means what he says, and that he follows through on promises that he makes. Now, in the last verse of this particular text, uh, in verse 18, we learn the effects of God's goodness toward us. So it says there, of his own will, forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What does it mean that God is good? And what does it mean in our individual lives? Um, well, first of all, it means that he is, he is to be born again. As James says it, to be brought forth. He's sort of using the language of birth there um, and, and applying it to spiritual rebirth. It was God's will that that happened uh, in us. It was God's will that we be saved. Isn't that a good thing? We certainly wouldn't want the opposite to be true, that he didn't want us to be saved, that he didn't want to save us. You know, James, uh, I mean, Jesus, when he had his uh, nighttime talk with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus that no one could enter God's kingdom without being must be born again, he said to Nicodemus. And, and that's God's happen to each one of us, that each one of us be born again when we hear the, uh, when we hear the good news, when we hear the gospel, the word of truth, as it's called here. Uh, uh, another place that addresses this is in First uh, Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Uh, Peter writes there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, listen to what, the way he he's caused us to be born again 
to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The supreme example of God's goodness toward us is that he wants us to be saved. That is to live with him for eternity. Uh, he wants us to be saved from eternal punishment. Highest example of God's goodness, and He's made it possible through Jesus and what He did for us on the cross. Second thing is wonderful as well. Uh, as as the passage closes in verse eighteen, James says that God's goodness makes it possible that we would be the first fruits of His creatures getting at the first fruits of his creatures well think about it maybe a little bit logically here the great thing about first fruits is what it implies it implies that there will be more first fruits that there will be second fruits third fruits and on and on so yes God wants us to be saved individually, uh, through the gospel of Christ, but he does not want it to end with us. He wants others to be saved as well. We may be the first fruits in our situation, but he will use us to pass these good things along to others. Uh, scripture says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his divine will. So our God is good. He is a God of salvation. He wants us to be saved and he wants us to pass that on to others. So sort of in, in, in summary, let's remember that every good and perfect gift comes from him from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shifting shadows. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Bob the story of a couple who took their son, who was 11 years old, and their daughter, who was 7, to, to Carlsbad Caverns. Uh, it's in New Mexico. Some of you may have been there. But he took the, the kids' vacation to Carl to experience the tour there of the caverns. Uh, but the, the, the custom is when the tour reaches the deepest point in the cavern, the guide will turn off the lights, uh, all the lights that are uh, man-made down there to, to dramatize how completely dark and silent it is below the earth's surface for all the uh, visitors, you know. And so he did that. He turned the lights off when they got to the deepest point of the cavern. And so you have this little seven-year-old girl who uh, goes into a bit of a panic attack. She's suddenly enveloped in utter darkness that she probably never experienced before, even in the darkness of her bedroom. And uh, she's frightened. She begins to cry. And uh, immediately, just a few years older, spoke up and said, don't cry. Somebody here knows how to turn on the lights. Don't cry. Somebody here turn on the lights. That, to me, is a, is a perfect illustration of the gospel. Uh, it's, it's the word of God. Somebody knows how to turn on the lights. That somebody is our Father. That somebody did that through His Son, Jesus, the Messiah, God's best and most perfect gift. And so he's good. And he gives good gifts. And we just close by, by 
by asking ourselves the question, you know, have we claimed that gift and um, have we called on him? And if not, why not? Why not today? Take advantage and respond to the good father. Beautiful passage, James 1, 16. And great wisdom uh, there for us for living. Why don't we pray as we conclude? Good Father, thank you for your love and your mercy and grace for giving us every good thing. Thank you for giving us your word and for a few minutes to spend in it. Pray that we have interpreted it and understood it well and that we'll now live it out and benefit from it and share it with someone. I pray your blessing on all those who either recording or involved in the study. I help them tonight to be more in love with you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.